Thank you very much for that introduction. I thought we were going to sing Christmas carols all night, which is probably what we should be doing. We used to do that many years ago, when we'd, on Christmas Eve, we'd go out to various homes and uh, stand outside and sing Christmas carols, because they, they really are very lovely, apart from the fact that they, the message that they give out is extremely important. So I thought we were going to do that tonight, but uh, somehow it didn't happen. But I do say that because I love Christmas carols, particularly when they are sung with such melodious voices such as the one we've had here and we've witnessed this evening. Because as I was growing up, as I've mentioned, I lived, always lived for the day when we would sing Gloria in Excelsis Gloria. Do you remember that? Can we sing that? Gloria in Excelsis I love that. It's such a wonderful um, carol. Apart from the fact that you go out of breath when you sing that long glow. But it does say a lot about the season of Christmas. December was always one month in a year. But when I was younger, I lived for that one month. In fact, it's just one day. The Christmas day was just one day. But it felt as if it was, it was one month. And we'll spend the next day, that's Boxing Day, recovering from the excesses of the previous day. The whole month having been dominated by the pomp and pageantry of Christmas cheer. So much so that when it was all over, we almost literally had withdrawal syndrome. We sort of withdrew from the, the uh, almost a drug addiction of Christmas. The Christmas chair is quite intoxicating. Not only in the fact that it's a Christmas chair, but because of the joy and the celebration and the conviviality that it involves. But you know, it's quite a contrast from the first Christmas. The reaction to the coming of Christ was not a particularly happy or celebratory event. It was somber and it evoked a mixture of emotions. The circumstances surrounding his coming conveyed feelings of deep seriousness. There was perplexity, there was anxiety, there was curiosity, there was even fear. And you get that very clearly from the biblical nar narrative of the Christmas season. The biblical narrative makes no secret of that. All persons who are recorded in scripture in connection with the birth of Christ, displayed no merriment whatsoever. They displayed no mirth. They displayed no great rejoicing at the news. You might find that strange because we always associate Christmas with such great rejoicing. Let's take Mary, mother of Jesus, for instance. We read in the Gospel according to Luke that when the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. The Bible records that Mary was greatly troubled by his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. She was troubled and worried at the words of the angel 
that were pronounced to her. You read that in the book, in, in, in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 28 to 29. What's interesting though, it wasn't just Mary. The shepherds, for instance. You read that in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. The shepherds were living out their fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them. And the Bible then says, and they were terrified. And they were terrified, notwithstanding that the angel went on to say to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news and will cause great joy for all the people. That in Luke chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. So Mary was greatly troubled by the news that is brought to her by the angel. The shepherds are terrified by the sudden happenings before, in front of them. They're not the only ones. We have the civil authorities. We read in, in, in the same, in Matthew, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. Then the narrative continues. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So it wasn't just King Herod, but all Jerusalem with him. That's Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. So we have three different kinds of people. Mary, mother of, 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 of Jesus, troubled greatly troubled not just troubled but greatly troubled by the words of the angel the shepherds terrified by the happenings around them and then Herod deeply troubled and disturbed and all along with him the people in Jerusalem and even Simeon you remember Simeon the righteous and devout man who had been waiting for the consolation of Israel he held the little baby Jesus when he was brought after eight years, had been, been born after eight years, eight, eight, sorry, eight days, brought to the, to the temple. And he blessed him. And then he says this, said to Mary, the mother of Jesus, this child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too, says Simeon. Of course, later on he says that, that he now the Lord can take him away because he's actually seen the, 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 the Lord. So what I'm trying to say to you is that that first Christmas was not a time of extravagant gaiety, hilarity, and effusive, unrestrained joy. Mary had to contend with a possible ostracism from a society which would frown or frown upon a teenage girl found to be with child out of wedlock. The shepherds were terrified by the extraordinary enormity of what was before them. Simeon, clairvoyance, worried him about the future turmoil which would be exposed in the world by the advent of the child. And Herod's state was simply that of fear at the ushering in of the, of the center of power far greater than his, whose end, unlike his, could not be foretold. After all, through his wise men and establishment religious leaders, 
he must have been aware of the prophet Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 to 7 where the Isaiah said for unto us a child is born to us a son is given and they then said these salutary words and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace then he says this of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and forever the leaves of the Lord he said the, le the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accompany this what I'm trying to say to you is that that first Christmas wasn't a great joyous occasion for those who stood around, those who came face to face with the expressions of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The power with which he came, but the sobriety with which he came, and the punch with which he came. You know, Prophet Isaiah had foreseen the emancipation of the world in the complete moral and spiritual decadence. These were, as he writes in Isaiah chapter, chapter 9 verse 2, people walking in the darkness and also those who living in the land of the deep darkness. And he was referring only to those who lived those years. He was referring to us. He was referring to you and I. Never before, and I can say this without a shadow of a doubt or even the fear of the contradiction, but never before has mankind lived in times when the reality and the deity of God was so blatantly doubted as now. And the reality and the deity of God is forcefully denied as now. The world in which the very authority of Christ, which was foretold, and the immutability of his word, the Bible, is blindly and widely rejected as it is now. And I'm not talking to non-Christians. I'm talking about Christians. Much more even than the pagan societies at least had a modicum of worship to an, a hu, a, a, an almighty being. But they did it sincerely. We live at a time when our own worship is not quite there. Now, the scene is radically different. We might crone out melodious carols, but we live in a world with a dim and warped view of God. A world with a warped and dim view of God's word. And the context of all that is a vortex of a mixture of factors caused by a variety of reasons. One of them is the uncertainty of the times. You and I are transiting through seasons of great uncertainty. And I don't need to to enumerate all that, you already know that. But we have very fluid economies, unstable politics, greed, hegemonic conflicts, both hot and cold wars, prosecuted by proxy. At the moment we know of one hot, very hot war going on in Europe. But we all know that's a proxy war. There are also horrendous natural calamities, climatic upheavals, catastrophes, violent volcanic eruptions. 
tectonic shifts, floods, mudslides of biblical proportions, homicides, runaway depression among young people and older people, suicides, fratricides, and to make it worse, we're in the midst of a crisis of belief. That is belief in anything. Belief in anybody or anyone. We are in the middle of a crisis of faith. You see, conventional wisdom calls for emptiness of the heart, emptiness of the mind, emptiness of the soul. We are encouraged to trust and believe in nothing but self. There is emphasis on personal rights above all else. There is scant concern about responsibilities. Even now, even in our country, adults fighting for the right to deny children and grandchildren the right to know what is right. We're denying our children the right to know what is right. These, my friends, are the last days. As described for us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 17, the Apostle Paul writing as he does to a spiritual son, Timothy, he warns, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. You and I are in the last days. You occupy a world without hope. Yet hope is the only thing which is stronger than fear. When we are ensnared by fear, anxiety or perplexity, the first casualty is always hope. When hope is extinguished, self-worth exits, after which one can do anything and oneself on another. That is the backdrop which the first Christmas was, and indeed is the backdrop of the world in which you and I live. It is the backdrop of the circumstances in which we sing the Christmas carols is the backdrop of the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ and the coming of the Lord into this world in a great effort of emancipation to a people who are lost. What then is the antidote to this sordid state of affairs? The answer, my friends, my brothers and sisters, is true Christmas. The answer is true Christmas. The advent of Christ in his fullness into the individual lives to control and direct us. This would have the impact of immediate and wider families, impact on our communities and societies at large. Without that impact, we are actually performing. We are more concerned about our reputation, less concerned about our character. Because if that impact were there, this country would be different. Kenyan society will never change until Christians begin to live out their faith 
both in private as they might do in public. And hope begins not with the number of verses one knows in scripture, not the number of attendances in churches that we do, all of which are very important, but faith and hope begins with trusting God and his word. As God declares, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Very well-known words of Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Again, Hebrews chapter 6, 19 says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. You see, my brother and sister, we've got to conquer fear. We've got to conquer perplexity. We've got to conquer all that the evil one throws at us. And the only way we do that is trust. Trust in God. With respect to a world petrified by fear, the word of God declares that for the spirit of God gave us, gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Again, 2 Timothy chapters 1, 17. And for anxiety, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, but pray with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That's Philippians 4, 6. And it goes on to say, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It is in times of crises and adversity that the greatest opportunity exists. This is when the power of the word of God must be made. It's at Christmas when we are reminded again about the immense sacrifice that God in his own way has given to a life and for mine. It's at Christmas that we're reminded the humility of God when he comes as a newborn baby with all the weaknesses of human nature so that you and I could start a new life, to have a new lease of life. It is a Christmas that we're reminded God's, about God's love for each one of us. But it's also a Christmas that we're reminded that we also have to go. Tonight's talk was entitled The Citadel of Hope. A citadel is a fortress that commands a city and is used in the control of the inhabitants and in defense during attack or siege. You and I, all of us, need a citadel to enable us to stand firm in the face of adversity and challenge as it's thrown to us by the evil one and his agents. A citadel, the unshakable basis on which you and I stand is and must be the Lord Jesus Christ. We declare it openly and loudly. The question is, do we embrace it in our moments of quietness? Christmas calls us to rise up on the occasion which God has presented to us in our own generation and beyond. This is what Christian Christmas is all about. Carols are simply the evidence of a much stronger inner reality of salvation. We have been equipped. Emmanuel, God with us, has made that possible. Let us also equip others with a transformative gospel 
of the word of life. I had the opportunity just this last weekend to be at a meeting of an organization which seeks to make the Bibles available to the world. It's called Biblica. And this is the one thing, one of the thoughts that came to my mind as I realized what a tremendous responsibility was in our hands as we held these Bibles and we had to make them available to the whole world. And not just the book, but the word that seen the book. And I prayed the prayer, which I pray now, for myself and hopefully for some of you. Lord, I acknowledge and accept the power of your Holy Spirit in us and his transformative nature in the lives of all who believe. As prophet Isaiah chronicles for us in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8, he writes about God seeing Isaiah who has just seen the, the God. In, Isaiah was already working for God. He was doing a great work of God. But you come to chapter 6 and it opens up by the word in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. What does that mean? It seems that when King Uzziah exited the stage, suddenly Isaiah saw God as he is. Isaiah saw God as he wishes to be seen. Not the way that we construct him in our minds or construct him in our churches as he is in true nature. And when Isaiah saw this, he said, Woe unto me, I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. Because when we see God as he really is, then we see our true sin nature. And unless you and I see our true sin nature, we can never serve God. We might be able to make a show of it, but we can never serve him. We can never even get anybody else to serve him. And in the course of doing that, Isaiah coming to a point where he has said, uh, you know, the, 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 Lord, I see who you are, and he's seen God in his splendor. Then God says this, this is, you see in Isaiah 6, 8, Isaiah records, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? A question that has reverberated through the ages to the annals of history and the question that is relevant even now, even in this room. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then Isaiah records, and I said, here am I, Lord, send me. Don't send my neighbor, send me. Don't send my, my, my pastor, send me. Don't send anybody else, who, just send me, Lord. Now that's a terribly difficult thing to say. Send me. And why is it so difficult? Because it calls for sacrifice. It is only and It is because of that kind of giving of yourself that Mary the mother of Jesus, after she has been, she'd been told about what was about to happen to her, that she's going to conceive by the Holy Spirit. And with, 
all, the, all that meant to her as an individual in a society in which she lived. After doing that, she says this. In the great song, The Magnificat, that we all know about, she says this. In complete sacrifice, she says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from the thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he has promised our ancestors. That is complete supplication to the Lord. Complete self-giving to the Lord. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us that the folly of those who reject God will be clear to everyone. He also said that in fact everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know that those whom you have learned it and from whom infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So what are we saying? What we're saying is simply this that Christmas is a day of reflection it doesn't mean we shouldn't sing choruses we shouldn't sing carols we shouldn't rejoice yes we should because we've been emancipated by the self-giving God in Christ Jesus but also Christmas is a time for us to listen to our own hearts and ask ourselves, has he really been born in our lives? Because hope depends on that. And the only citadel of hope is Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? And as I will pray, I will ask some of those who came from Kaplan and Stratton to please come up here. Those who came from Kaplan and Stratton to please come. And the reason we pray this prayer simply because God in his mercy came to us and you read that in number, number 6 verse 24 to 26 and he said that we must bless those around us and he gives us the text of that blessing. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his entire countenance towards you and give you his peace. That Lord is our prayer tonight that we may hold on to the blessing that you have prescribed 
for your people. May this be the way in which we recommit ourselves in remembrance of this Christmas season that you came so that we might have life and have it most abundantly. For this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.